Welcome to the CAT Volunteer Training at the Jacksonville Humane Society. This will go over the CAT adoptions and CAT holding area. We appreciate you taking the time to watch our training videos and we're very excited to have you volunteering with us. First, we just wanna go over some goals for our CAT volunteers. The first goal is to provide a welcoming, non-judgmental environment for potential adopters. These adopters are how our animals are going to leave this facility, and so we want to make them feel welcome and provide the most resources that we possibly can. We want to keep our cats healthy and safe, and we'll talk about that throughout the entire presentation. We also want to increase adoptable behaviors through low stress training, and we want to decrease stress for happy, healthier animals through their enrichment activities. And then another goal is to assist the staff as needed. This can be animal care staff, adoption staff, medical staff, whoever's in the area that may ask you to do a task. The main cat volunteer responsibilities are to provide daily enrichment activities to cats in adoptions and the holding areas. To spot clean the kennels throughout the day, deep clean kennels as animals go home or if they get excessively messy, prevent the spread of disease in the shelter, provide basic customer service to potential adopters, ensure that all food and water bowls are clean before you leave, and ensure that cat rooms, the cat supply room and adoption center are neat and clean. Ensure that every adult cat has a scratch post and bag and holding, and to follow enrichment, disease spread prevention, and safety pro protocols developed by staff. This is by no means an inclusive list, although we tried to be as lengthy as we could. You may be asked to do something different by a staff member. If you're unsure or unclear about your instructions, please ask that staff member for clarification. All right, we're gonna get straight into it with disease spread and medical concern. Everyone at JHS plays a role in preventing the spread of disease. Here's how volunteers can play their part. Do not handle or pet kittens unless you're passing them to a potential adopter. Why? Because kittens are unvaccinated and their immune system is not fully developed. They're our most vulnerable population in the shelter and we want to keep them as happy and healthy as possible. Disease spread prevention procedures are not just to protect the animals here. We want to protect your pets as well. So we ask that you please change your clothes before handling your pets at home. This is why it's a good idea to always have your volunteer shirt on uh, when you're in the facility and then have a change of clothes when you go home. Many times our volunteers are interacting with the animals more than the staff is and so we count on you all to report any medical or behavior concerns. You can report these by using forms that can be found in the cat service area and in the enrichment room in the back hallway. Some medical examples include diarrhea, vomiting, blood, etc. Behavior examples include dilated eyes, pushing themselves into a corner, hissing, flat ears, excessive meowing, somebody who's not happy. You can turn these forms in at the ad adoptions boutique counter. The volunteer or staff member at that counter will then input it into a shelter love and it will get to the correct staff member that can address these concerns. If you have pressing concerns, for example, uh, you feel an animal is not feeling well or is actively trying to bite or scratch someone, please alert a staff member immediately. There's two cat diseases we want to go in a little bit more detail about. While we rarely see them in the shelter, we do want you guys to know what we're talking about or if you see any sort of medical notification about these two diseases. So FELV or feline leukemia is a virus that compromises the immune system, making cats more susceptible to infection, viruses, or cancer. Feline leukemia does typically reduce the lifespan of a cat. It's considered a lover's disease as it's passed through saliva, grooming, nursing kittens, and in utero. FIV or feline AIDS is a less serious condition that can cause a shortened lifespan, but often cats can have a normal lifespan. We condone FIV cats living with non-FIV cats as long as they can live amicably. It is considered a fighter's disease, which is why we need the cats to get along together if they're living together. And it's passed through bite wounds in utero and sometimes by nursing kittens. It can cause things like stomatitis, upper respiratory, or a suppressed immune system. Neither of these diseases is, are passable to humans or zoonotic. But research is changing all the time. We may have new research within the next couple of years that could change all of these facts. So always refer customer questions to staff. 
Okay, now we're going to move on to body language and handling. There's three videos that I'd like you to watch so that you can answer questions at the end of this. Hi, I'm Nikki Trevorrow and I work at Cats Protection. Today we're going to look at some behaviours um, of these lovely animals here, cats, and, um, and see why they're actually quite complicated and quite subtle in their behaviours, much more so than social species such as ourselves and dogs. So, let's have a look at the cats and see what you think is going on. When a cat comes towards you with their tail up, usually pointing at the top, it's a sign of their greeting in cats. This is a lovely behaviour to say that usually when they're greeting you when they're coming home or they're soliciting attention. Um, the best thing to do with these behaviours is to acknowledge their greeting and usually give them a bit of fuss, like a head rub, for example. When cats are rubbing around ourselves or other objects in the environment, usually corners of things, um, they're often using like, parts of their body like their cheeks and up here and their sides. They're actually depositing scent. Whilst it looks like a really gorgeous behaviour where they're sort of smooching these areas, it is in fact scent marking. We often see these behaviours, um, particularly when we first arrive home, for example, when they're rubbing around our legs. It is a greeting behaviour as well, but primarily because we smell a bit funny where we've been out and they're trying to make us smell more familiar. The slow blink is one of my favourite behaviours. This is where you slow blink at a cat, so really slowly up and closing your eyes, and in a perfect cat etiquette, just turning your head slowly to the side. This is showing the cat that you're nice and relaxed in their presence and that you're not threatening at all. If you're really lucky, the cat will slow blink you back. When cats have got their ears flattened either to the side or back, this can be a sign of stress, that they're quite frightened. What's really important when, for cats that are feeling stressed and frightened is to give them a place to hide and the opportunity to get up high. You know when you return home and the cat throws itself on its side and shows you its belly? Often many people misinterpret this behaviour and think it wants its tummy rubbed. Now unfortunately, those people that will have tried this behaviour will, um, will unfortunately get their uh, sort of grab round their hand and um, maybe the cat will bite them as well. That's because what this cat is really doing is showing a greeting behaviour and also that it feels relaxed in your presence. It trusts you. And um, it's almost an abuse of that trust to go and straight their tummy. What the cat would rather you do is just to give them a slight head rub and that's it. Lip licking can occur for a variety of different reasons. For example, if they've just had something to eat, then you'll notice them doing a really big lick. However, it can also be a sign of nausea, and in this particular cat, it's a sign of stress. So when cats are stressed, it's really important to give them a place to hide and the opportunity to get up high. Parodin is one of those behaviours that's familiar to all cat owners. It often shows a cat that's content, often soliciting attention, um, but sometimes it can actually be a sign that the cat is in pain. I hope you've enjoyed looking at these cat behaviours and found them interesting. Hopefully when you go home today, you'll look at your cat with a whole new light and hopefully it'll improve your relationship with them as well. Hey everybody, this is Jackson Galaxy at Chewy. Today we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of petting your cat. The first don't is to approach your cat straight on. Cats see that as a threat. Try not to do that. The other thing you don't want to do is assume that every cat wants to be pet because a lot don't. And if you've ever watched me before, you know that that could end really badly for you. So allow the cat to pet you. The way you do that is you just sit down, put your hand down by your side, allow the cat to explore you. When they come up close, what you're going to do is what I call the Michelangelo technique. That is holding your finger out just a little bit, pretending that your finger is like a nose. So when the cat walks up, they go nose to your finger, then they're petting you. The best way to do that, allow them to press up against you, they're gonna start going to the cheek, the top of the head, and under the chin. If you stick around this area, you are going to have a good experience with your cat. Cats are like any stranger. You wouldn't want somebody walking up to you, giving you a big hug and rubbing your hair when you've never met them before. So that's the do's and don'ts of petting a cat. Now go and let your cat pet you. I'm Jackson Galaxy. Thanks for watching. to remove a cat, it is important to assess the cat's behaviour to plan the most appropriate approach for that cat. 
Is it a calm, friendly cat? Or an anxious cat that may become more difficult to handle? Or is it already in an aggressive frame of mind, making it dangerous to approach with unprotected arms and hands? Good observation will allow appropriate planning to meet each situation safely and with minimum stress to the cat. This confident, alert, relaxed cat is sitting at the front of the cage in an upright position with ears pricked and is engaging with the environment. Move calmly, talk to the cat in friendly tones and approaching from the side, extend a closed hand. Let the cat sniff your hand and assess its response. If it's positive, as here, you can go on and stroke the cat's head and neck. If the cat accepts this further contact, reach in and place a hand under the thorax to lift the forequarters and gently draw the cat towards you. Use your other arm to support the cat's weight so it feels secure and talk throughout in a calm, friendly way. Observing this cat from a distance, we see that it is less relaxed and positioned in the far corner of the cage. The cat is alert and anxious and is hyper aware of everything going on around. Approaching this anxious but friendly cat calmly from a distance and offering an outstretched hand elicits a positive response of a social head rub and the cat even stands up to accept being stroked. Stroking the left side of the cat's face encourages it to turn towards me so I can slide a hand under the thorax to gently lift. I use my forearm to support the cat's weight and my right arm to stroke and keep the cat feeling secure. Holding friendly cats close to your body allows you to gently restrain them without holding them tightly, and this reduces wriggling. Providing a comfortable place to hide is a great way to help cats feel more comfortable within a veterinary cage. If the hide has a base, it can also be used to remove the cat from the cage safely and without stress. Make sure you keep a hand under the hide to support the cat's weight so it feels secure and is not left dangling. Once out of the cage, most friendly cats will emerge from the hide to explore the new surroundings. But if not, a soft hide with a generous size opening allows them to be gently removed without you having to reach in and drag the cat out. This more anxious cat is lying down at the back of the cage, again highly alert. The cat's ears are flattened and the tail is flicking. To assess the cat's response, move calmly and slowly and talk soothingly. Let me get you out. Good girl. Approach the cat from the side rather than head on and extend an arm to maintain your distance initially and offer a closed hand to sniff. This cat responds to the approach but is clearly not completely comfortable turning away and remaining at the back of the cage. Continue to give time and space and here the cat accepts a gentle stroke and continues to respond well to the proffered hand. However, if I try to pick the cat up it responds by hissing and moving away to avoid further handling. When I persist in trying to pick the cat up, it wriggles to try to escape my grasp. When you're handling an animal, your eyes need to be on the animal. Bites and scratches often happen when people are not reading a cat's body language properly. You can also help customers with this. If you are observing them holding a cat, you can talk to them about body language and what you've learned in this video. People love hearing tips um, as well as learning about what a cat is trying to tell us. If a cat does get loose, do not panic and do not attempt to chase or grab the cat. Close the doors to the cat room immediately and let the staff know. If you or a customer are injured, whether that's an animal bite, scratch, or serious fall, please alert a staff member immediately. If you cannot alert, please send someone to alert someone. Okay, now we're getting into my favorite part, which is enrichment. Um, this is just a great section on how you can help our cats stay calm and happy in the shelter system. So stress can be genetic or it can be based on past experiences. Experiences that increase stress in animals are negative experiences with places, people, or other animals, people ignoring stress signs in the animal, allowing animals to fixate or stare at each other, new situations, illness, and then punishment or aversive training. So think about those situations where the cats may be in when they enter the shelter. This is a brand new situation. Sometimes people have been ignoring their stress signals, which is why they end up with us. 
Um, they also may have had a negative experience with a person, which is why they've ended up with us, or they may have been sick. So there's several, several experiences in here that a cat can go through before they make it to the adoption floor, which makes them very stressed. Enrichment is a mandatory part of your shift, and it's the most important thing you can do for the cats. We do daily enrichment activities here, and the goal is to keep our pets healthy, their mind and their body. So we have different days that are assigned different enrichment activities. Sunday is catnip, Monday is boxes. You get the idea throughout the week. Checklists are found in the cat adoption service area and cat holding A and D. The activities vary from bubbles to scented toys and more, and we always are adding new things to our wish list. So you may see new toys arrive, new food puzzles arrive. Items are labeled in the supply areas, and please let staff know if items are missing or you can't find where they are. In an effort to better promote our long-term residents, we ask that after you've completed 15 hours of volunteering, you pick a project cat. A project cat is a cat that needs a little bit more attention. He or she needs to be highlighted and we need your help to do it. To get started, email behavior at jackshumane.org to receive a list of cats that are in need of a project partner. Meet your project cat and pick three goals that you'd like to achieve with them. Email those goals to behavior at jackshumane.org and we'll make a special kennel card for your project cat. As you achieve your goals, you'll get stickers on the kennel card for everyone to see. Take cute pictures or videos of your project cat and then spread them on social media. Send them to behavior at jackshumane.org so we can post them on our website. Customer service is a large part of your role as a cat volunteer. This obviously only occurs when we are open to the public, which on weekdays is from 12 to 7 and on weekends 10 to 5. It's really important that we have volunteers around when potential adopters are here so that they can hold kittens or cats as well as learn about our adoption process from you. When you talk to someone in cats, smile, greet them, and thank them for coming and ask how you can help them. If they ask where to look, briefly explain the layout of the adoption area and tell them if they find anyone they are interested in to come tell you their name so a staff person can introduce them. If they ask about puppies or kittens, point them in the direction they would be if we have any, but encourage them to browse the entire facility. We've had people come in who wanted a puppy but end up leaving with an adult dog. Only staff should handle questions regarding admissions, medical, or behavior information. This includes any questions about a cat's temperament. Please refrain from offering advice to potential adopters. If the potential adopters have specific questions, please direct them to, to ask staff during their counseling session. And remember, what once worked for you may not work for someone else. It also may not follow our animal handling procedures or standards. Our shelter hours to let the public know is adoptions is open Monday through Friday from 12 to 7 and Saturday and Sunday 10 to 5. Our pet help services, which helps with stray, found animals, owner surrenders, and other help services is open Monday through Friday, 9 to 6, and Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 5. Our community animal hospital, which is open to the public and does take appointments, is open Tuesday through Friday from 8 to 5 and Saturday, 8 to 1. If anyone asks you adoption prices, they are as followed. Kittens under six months are $75. Cats over six months are 50. Puppies under six months and dogs under 30 pounds are $125, and adult large dogs are $50. There are some additional fees. A $20 rabies licensing fee applies if adopters reside in Duval County, and if the animal is three months or older and has a rabies vaccine. All cats must leave in carriers. Adopters are welcome to bring their own, but we do provide a cardboard cat carrier for $749. All dogs must leave on a leash and collar. Prices depend on size and adopters can bring their own. Potential adopters are welcome to walk around the facility and find a pet they're interested in. Once they find a pet, they let the front desk know the pet's name and then wait for a counselor. The counselor will go over any questions and information about the pet. The majority of the pets can go home the same day. The counselor will talk about their options. Cleaning is a large portion of what happens daily in the shelter. It's also extremely important, again, to reduce stress and reduce illness in our cat population. 
we're going to watch a couple of videos of different types of cleaning techniques and then I'll walk you through some different processes that we have here at the Jacksonville Humane Society. All of our cat areas are available for cleaning. Places that volunteers can clean without further training are in the cat adoptions, which are the lobby cages, cats room, cat rooms one and two, and the group rooms one through five. We also have cat holdings A and D. If you're interested in learning how to clean the isolation rooms, please see a staff member and they can help instruct you. In kitten season, which in Jacksonville is April through November, we may have spread out to other holding areas. A staff member will direct you if there's other areas that are available for cleaning. Our first cleaning video, we start with spot cleaning. Heather goes up to this kennel and notices there's a kitten inside and goes ahead and opens the kennel door and removes the food and water dishes. We do reuse food and water dishes as long as they are relatively clean and there's no dry food um, stuck in there or uh, feces or urine in the water dishes or food bowls or anything like that. Um, so she is going to refresh uh, the water and the food. Kittens only need about a quarter cup per kitten um, of dry food. They don't eat a whole lot of it. Next, she is going to remove the litter pan. All kittens should get these aluminum litter pans. Um, she's going to dump that first to see if we can reuse it, but it's gross, so we're going to toss that and get a new one. And you just want to use a low layer of litter, about two scoops works, um, but we just want a low layer. Um, we want the kittens to obviously have something to go to the bathroom in, but we also don't want them to kick it out everywhere. Next, she's going to take out their towel and um, make sure to shake that out. Notice how she's closing the kennel behind her each time. We don't want kittens running around loose um, anytime we're doing uh, this type of cleaning. So she's taking, shaking the towel out, uh, making sure all the litter and food get out, and then she's gonna just check the towel, make sure it's not wet. There's no feces or anything like that, um, urine or anything like that, and then she's gonna replace it if, it if it's okay. If it's not, she can get a new towel. She's also now just removing some extra debris Notice also how she's working around the kitten. Um, she's not trying to remove him or kind of keeping him out of the way. She's just kind of working around him. Another technique is to also provide wet food on the upper shelf um, and let them eat some canned food while they stay out of your way. Now we're gonna reset up the kennel and uh, we always wanna put the food and water as far away from the litter box as we possibly can. It's really important to remember that um, if there is an animal in the kennel, we never want to spray disinfectant um, or remove all of their uh, food bowls and blanket every single time. Um, as we saw in the last video, cats really enjoy placing their scent on things that are familiar with them that are that make them comfortable. And so when we can um, keep the same food and water dishes and keep the same towel um, and toys, we provide them with a more comfortable environment where they understand what's going on in, in a very stressful environment. Um, so that's why it's really, really important to spot clean. This video goes over deep cleaning a kennel. We deep clean a kennel when an animal has been moved or adopted. So Heather is going to notice that the kennel card's on the ground, which means the cat got adopted, and she's going to start removing everything from the kennel and dumping everything into the trash. This includes litter, food, and water. Um, this cat had a reusable metal pan, so we are going to keep that and take that into the service room for cleaning. She's going to remove the linens and shake them out. Even though these are gonna go into the laundry, we wanna make sure we shake them out first so that we don't have food and litter going into the laundry machine. She's gonna take all of her items into the service area and put her linens in the dirty laundry bin and place her dirty dishes in front of the sink or next to the sink. She's then going to take Rescue, which is the spray cleaner we use, the disinfectant, and she's going to spray every surface of the kennel. This includes walls, shelves, grooves, the front of the kennel. Um, just be aware and make sure you're not spraying into the neighboring kennels. This then needs to sit for about five minutes before you can wipe it down. This is a great time to provide enrichment to the neighboring kennels or even spot clean kennels around where you're currently working. 
When you're ready, you can start wiping down. Heather starts here by wiping down the front of the, the cage. Um, we do ask that you um, do use a washcloth or a rag um, and um, make sure that you're using a different one for each kennel. Again, we're trying to disinfect in between each animal here. And we wanna make sure we get every nook and cranny. Um, as you can imagine, every kitten <laughs> throws food and litter just about in every corner of that kennel. So we wanna make sure it's nice and clean uh, for the next animal that's coming in. So she's gonna wipe down all of those surfaces, including that little portal um, area, the walls, the ceiling, the shelf, and make sure everything is nice and clean. Occasionally, if a kitten or cat is very messy, it can take a couple go-arounds before you're completely clean. She also does lift the um, adjoining. All of these kennels are connected, the portals are connected, so she's just lifting that to deep clean under it to make sure, again, that all of the debris and everything is wiped out. And then we do ask that you don't set up the kennel so that we know that a kennel is deep cleaned unless you're directed to do so by a staff member. If a staff member does direct you to clean, to, excuse me, set up a open deep cleaned kennel, you would just place a clean litter pan and then turn over uh, deep cleaned dishes uh, in that kennel. That way the person coming up to put a kitten in there uh, would know that the, um, the kennel has been deep cleaned. So when we're cleaning dishes and the litter pans, um, all the dishes are cleaned using soap and hot water first to remove the debris, then they're soaking in hot water with an eight table, tablespoon of turbo shock, and then we rinse them with warm water and allow them to dry. They need to soak in that turbo shock for about five minutes. I like to kind of check in on my dishes throughout my cleaning process so that if I need to clean some and soak some and then go clean some cages while they're soaking, I can kind of do that. Litter pans and adoptions, those big, um, those big metal pans, they're completely separate from food bowls. We use our mop sink, we use that soap and hot water, and then we soak them with the turbo shock for five minutes, and then you rinse them with warm water and allow them to air dry. Any of the aluminum pans and any litter pans and holding areas should be thrown away. When we're setting up kennels, when staff asks us to set up kennels, or let's say a blanket is soiled or something like that, we wanna make sure we're setting up um, these condos properly. So when you're setting up a cat kennel, you wanna make sure that the, they have these items, blankets, beds, a litter box, food and water bowls, and then if they're an adult, they're gonna have a scratch pad. You can offer food to any cats without an orange special diet sticker. If they have that sticker, that just means they need a special medical food and staff will provide that for them. Please keep the litter box and the food bowls on opposite sides of the condos because no one likes to eat in the bathroom. I know this is difficult as we have some kittens that are in the single condos, but try to keep the litter box and the food and water as separate as possible while maximizing living space. If a cat is hiding, shy, or feel for, fearful during this time or while you're setting up, um, make sure you fill out one of those behavior cards so that we can give them a box or we can provide them with a better setup. For cat holding, we have a little different kennel setup. When you're setting up a cat kennel and holding, please make sure the cat has these items, a blanket or a bed, and either a lift with a towel draped over, a brown paper bag, or a tent bed. They do not need all three of these things, they just need one. And you'll see what I mean in a minute when I show pictures of the lift. A litter box, food and water bowls, and a scratch pad if they're an adult. You can offer food to any cat that does not have an orange special diet sticker. If possible, try to keep the litter box on opposite side of food and water dishes. And hiding places should never be facing front. Okay, here's some pictures of our holding setup kennels. So the first picture on the left is our small cage with a loft um, or lift. Um, so these are um, providing cats with hiding spaces as well as a, plate, a chance to get high. You can see we have that gray cat blanket draped over the front. So if the cat wants to hide behind it, they, they can. We also have the litter box in front and we have the food bowls kind of hiding towards the back. That way they're as separated as possible. 
In the large cage, we have the lift is under that bed and towel, and again, providing a hiding space. And we can even put food and water in those hiding spaces. And then the litter pan goes to the side. If a cat is in a kennel that is, does not fit a lift or a loft, um, then we can provide them with a tent bed, um, as well as, again, their food and water is over to the left, the litter box is all the way to the right, and they also have a scratch pad. Here's some signs you might see while you're cleaning. Um, you'll see these everywhere, the staff only and the bite quarantine signs you're only going to see in holding, but the reserved for surgery and the I'm in surgery signs you will see. The reserved for surgery means a cat is going to be moving into that kennel after surgery. The I'm in surgery, which is just the little half tag in that upper right hand corner, means the cat will be coming back to its original kennel, so you only need to spot clean. The staff only and bite quarantine signs, this means that staff can only feed these cats and that could be due to behavior or medical concerns. So we wanna make sure that we follow that. These cats, there's a reason these cats have these signs. Um, the bite quarantine, it's actually state law that staff only interact with these animals. So we wanna make sure that we're following that. When kennel bedding is changed, it is your responsibility to get dirty bedding to the laundry room. The laundry room for adoption is in the cat service room and the laundry room for holding is in the intake area. If laundry is ripped, has holes, or is overly soiled, and by that we mean if it has feces or urine or anything on it, please throw it away. The red bin is dirty and the blue bin is clean. Always feel free to, clean to fold clean laundry.
Please do not enter any other animal areas without proper training. This includes any of the dog areas, the clinic, and foster. We ask that you do not touch kittens in the foster area. These kittens are extremely susceptible to disease and they are needing to go into foster homes so that they can stay safe, happy, and healthy. Here's just a few housekeeping notes before we kind of wrap up our, our lesson today. Please do not put cat feces in the dog toilets, throw feces and litter into the trash can. We ask that before you leave to keep your areas neat and organized. Nothing should be on top of the kennels, supplies should be stored in the supply closets, and drinks and food should be left in the break room. Also, we ask that you do not move supplies around unless instructed by a staff. Each area has its own broom, dustpan, and cleaning supplies, and that helps us stay focused for the next cleaning session. This is what a typical volunteer ship looks like start to finish. Step one is to sign in logistics before you arrive. This allows us to track our volunteer numbers as well as make any pleas or figure out where we need volunteers the most. Step two is to sign in when you arrive at the shelter. This allows us to track your hours. Jacksonville Humane Society receives donations and grants based on volunteer hours, so this is a really important step for us. Step three, cleaning is needed. If you're unsure what areas still need to be cleaned, please ask a staff member. Step four, the enrichment activity. Make sure to check it off if you've done an activity. Step four, tidy your area before leaving. Please don't leave a mess behind for the next volunteers or the staff members. And then step five, sign out. During your CAT volunteer onboarding class, you will get a hands-on training of all this information by one of our staff members. Remember, you may be nervous on your first shift. Please ask us any questions. We are here to help and we appreciate you. Important people to know and next steps. Me, I'm Lexi. I'm the behavior manager here. You can reach me at ldonnelly at jackshumane.org. You can also reach me on my office phone at 904-493-4585. Jasmine, who's our volunteer coordinator, you can reach her at volunteer at jackshumane.org or her phone number at 904-493-4569. Complete the quiz on the next slide, sign up in Logistics, and then get ready to volunteer. Please email your answers to behavior at jackshumane.org. Thank you for volunteering. We could not achieve what we do without you. We ask that you're patient, flexible, and kind. We are always growing and learning. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.